Um, welcome to the webinar uh, this morning on planning for grain storage, the first of a monthly series. Um, as I said, my name is Chris Warwick. I'm a consultant based in Horsham in Victoria, and uh, I manage the GRDC's grain storage extension project. Uh, my role uh, has changed over the past uh, and, and developed over the past 10 years um, to now, uh, since we lost, very sadly lost Peter Botter um, 12 months ago, um, I now service the GRDC's southern region, um, holding grain storage workshops and, and providing information to, um, to industry and growers. Um, as I said, please feel free to um, write your questions as we go. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, and there'll be another opportunity at the end. I'd like to thank the BCG for, for facilitating the session for us today. Um, if you're having trouble hearing me, I can't see the PowerPoint at any time, please just um, comment in the, in the question box there and let us know. Planning for storage, let's get into it. Just an overview for a start, what's happening in on-farm storage? Um, no surprises there. We're seeing um, storage capacity increasing. Um, our survey data now shows that um, growers can store 40 to 50 percent of their average product, grain production. Um, so, in an average year, they can store nearly half of what they produce. The other thing we're really seeing is that the uh, the length of time grain is being stored for is growing. So, rather than your typical old um, you know, people storing grain for in their three to six months every year, it's now becoming more common to see growers store grain for 12 months, two years or longer when those opportunities arise. So a particular commodity might be um, underpriced and so they'll choose to store that one for a long period of time. And that puts more pressure on um, obviously the risk of loss uh, and so more pressure on the quality of storage and, 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 uh, and how it's managed. Um, main drivers, no um, no revelations there, obviously wanting to increase profit. How are they doing that? Through risk mitigation, um, harvest logistics efficiencies, it is getting bigger. Um, value adding through marketing, of course. Um, the other big one we're seeing is people trying to um, get some efficiencies in logistics and, and freighting direct from farm to port or to the end user. So, um, you know, running decent sized trucks and, and actually doing the freight themselves. Um, and really looking at trying to get a return on investment, comparing um, for each farming operation, what's the best return on investment? Is it doing grain storage? Is it upgrading machinery? Or is it actually buying more land? So I'd encourage you looking at planning for storage, figure out exactly that, figure out what it is that you're really aiming for uh, with, with the on-farm storage. Is it marketing that you're really trying to get is it harvest logistics, just short term, but really, really quite fast? Do you want opportunity for, uh, for cleaning or for blending or drying? Or is it a freight advantage? And if so, how long will you need to store that grain for? In a lot of cases, that will determine how, um, what type of storage will actually be suited to your system. So let's go through a, different, a few different storage types and just go through um, I guess the advantages and disadvantages of each, and that'll help us again determine which storage might be suitable for us. So cone bottom silos, we're all familiar with them, um, typically range from you know, your quite small 30 tonne um, in the transport all up to about 120 tonne, um, and then you can get built on site ones, cone bottoms that are bigger. Um, there's potential for these to be sealed to the Australian standard 2628 for fumigation, it's not guaranteed that they are. Um, some manufacturers are, are still struggling to meet that standard. So if you're looking at silos, that's a key criteria for me. They, they need to guarantee and write on the invoice that that silo will meet the Australian standard 2628. That, what that means is that we can actually fumigate in that silo successfully and control all life stages of, uh, of grain storage pests. Um, Ideally, the silos will be aeratable, um, so uh, we can do aeration cooling in them uh, for pest prevention. A cone bottom, obviously, they're easy to, to empty and to clean out. Um, typically, being smaller size, they allow really good segregation um, at the different 
grades or, or different um, different commodities altogether. Um, I'd encourage you to look at ladders for uh, for monitoring um, and as well as maintenance. If you can't get to the top of the silo safely, it's there's really um, you're really limited in um, how often you can actually get up there and check the grain um, or, or do maintenance on the seals around the lid. Um, obviously, these storages um, allow your flexibility in your storage period. So you, you can store for you know, several years um, grain in storage in these silos. They're quite secure. If you have those things that I've just been through, good monitoring, good aeration, able to fumigate, then there's no reason you can't store for quite long periods. On the downside, obviously, they're, um, they require capital up front. Um, so that's, that's the downside. Um, and being smaller segregations, um, you do need to move the auger a bit more often, so um, a, bit, a bit more playing around at harvest time for, for that sort of stuff. We move then to the flat bottom silos, typically larger quantities, um, quite a range in what you can get in the flat bottom. Um, and, uh, and we've all seen them around farms. Again, there's potential for flat bottoms to be sealed to the strain standard 26, 28 um, for fumigation, but it's not guaranteed. So what you need to ask the manufacturer for is that they'll guarantee that standard and they'll put it on the invoice. Um, I, I can't stress how important that is. Um, yeah, our resistance to phosphine is still growing, so we need to um, we need to try and use that at, at, um, as best we can, and that is in a gas type silo that meets that Australian standard 26, 28. Again, cone bottom silos can be aeratable. Uh, I'd encourage for aeration cooling, we actually don't need the full floor aeration. I would recommend the trench style aeration for the fact that you can lift it up and clean out under that floor. So the full floor aeration, can't, they're very difficult to get, get the floor up and actually clean under them for hygiene purposes. So. Um, what you gain in a little bit more even aeration, you actually lose in being able to do good hygiene. Flat bottom, obviously large capacity, um, efficient to fill and empty. Um, being that larger capacity, you don't have to move your auger so often. Uh, and again, fairly secure, so your storage period is not limited. Um, on the downside, same as the cone bottom silos, uh, capital cost up front, the obvious one. Um, we don't get as much segregation as the smaller cone bottoms. Uh, and they're a bit more work to clean out. They're all pretty obvious. Grain sheds, obviously a multi-purpose investment, um, usually low cost, uh, capital cost per tonne, um, but when getting out of storage. Um, and it's possible to aerate. Um, it is limited into how efficient that aeration can be and how even it is. Um, it takes a bit more work to set up, but it is certainly possible. Pest and vermin control in the sheds is a limitation. Um, we need to have a strategy there. Empty and clean out, depending on your system, is, is a bit more work. Um, but again, you need to find a system that works for you. And of course, there's the grain contamination risk there being a multi purpose. Um, whether there's a bit of hay residue left in there or um, from, from a bit of mud from machinery or even. Uh, multi-purpose people putting fertilizer in there really need to make sure that fertilizer is cleaned out so we don't get contamination. Bag, we all hear a lot about as a, as a cheap alternative um, for grain storage. They certainly have a low capital cost up front. They do allow pretty good segregation, so that, that's a good advantage. Um, I think their main advantage is that the flexibility in, in, in capacity and location. So. Um, particularly if you're leasing a farm that you don't want to go and invest in grain storage, they're, they're a good option for that. Um, or or to, to take that, um, uh, those bigger harvests perhaps. Obviously the downsides, a um, bit more labour required in the setup of the site preparation, um, which is really key to storing in bags successfully is that site preparation, um, selecting the right spot and then, and then doing the preparation well. Obviously a bit more labour and managing them too, going around monitoring them, um, patching up any holes that might get in them, uh, and then uh, managing the outflow. A bit more labour. Um, we haven't found a, a way yet um, that I'm aware of to aerate them really successfully, so grain quality over time, um, over a longer period of time, might be a bit of an issue. Um, 
we can't believe it's actually cooling through to bring that temperature down. That's, that's a potential one. Um, obviously, being a, a, a more temporary type of storage, the risk of damage and loss will increase the longer you have the bags out there. So really good um, shorter term storage if you're just looking for harvest logistics or um, those sorts of things, shorter term, um, have, have a great place for that. But longer term, obviously, the longer you leave it there, um, the better job you need to do, but also the, the risk of damage increases. Um, so obviously within a storage period, but they, um, they certainly work well when they're mapped to your, your system and managed well. Bunkers, on-farm bunkers. Um, again, low capital cost up front, um, like the bags, flexible capacity and flexible location. You can, you can set them up um, in a lot of places. Um, it's some of the bags, a bit more labour required, both in the setup, uh, the site preparation, actually inloading and then managing them and then outloading, all, all require a bit more labour, a bit more mucking around. Um, I guess that offsets that, that there are low capital cost up front. Again, growing quality aeration um, through bunkers is possible, but it's a bit of work. Um, needs, needs a bit of planning and, and a good system setup. And again, the longer you store in the bunker, the, the, long, the, the more your risk of damage and loss. Um, it, it is possible to fumigate in bags. Um, and it, it takes um, takes a bit of know-how to, how to do it successfully to kill uh, insects at all life stages. Um, potential commercial fumigators um, would be a good option there. So what are we aiming to do in, in any one of these storages really um, to my way of thinking, it's about pest prevention. We don't want to get insects in there. If we do, how do we control them? And as well as that, how do we manage the grain quality? So pest prevention, how are we going to do hygiene, really good cleanup? Um, can we do a structural treatment to clean any insects that might be left there? Can we put aeration cooling in it to prevent insects um, and then stop them breeding? Can we use a protectant on the grain in, in that particular storage? Um, and that protectants for those shorter term storages work really well for sheds um, particularly, or unsealed storage. And then can we monitor the grain? How, how can we actually take a sample? Um, can we get to the top of the silo and actually check um, the quality of that grain and if there's any insects in there? So thinking ahead for how you're going to do this pest prevention rather than uh, just hoping for the best. Pest control, so if we do get a um, a pest problem, what are our options in those storages to uh, to actually control them? As I said, if we've got gas type storage to the Australian standard 2628, we can use phosphine. And at the moment, that's the cheapest um, control that we have on the farm, uh, and largely due to the fact that um, with the appropriate um, accreditation, you can use that on the farm. Failing that, the, you're then looking at a commercial fumigator of controlled atmosphere, all of which um, are a higher cost to the, to the farmer, but a good rotation to put in there with phosphine to help phosphine last longer. And of course, grain quality. Um, we want to manage over time. And again, the longer we're storing the grain, the more, um, the more important it is that we really manage quality. And that's about keeping the moisture and temperature as low as we can. Um, the research shows that um, the better we can do that, the better we maintain the grain quality. So I'd, I really encourage you, rather than look at storage and say, okay, just what's the cheapest? You know, should, should we go for, for silos, for bags, um, for, for bunkers or sheds? What's the cheapest? I'd really encourage you to actually look at it a little bit differently and say, what are we actually trying to do with our storage? Is it harvest logistics? Do we just want short term, really fast? Or do we actually want to, um, do we have a local market we're going to store grain for and, and cut it ourselves? Uh, are the seasonal market trends that we're trying to capture um, that could be for many months? Uh, is there a freight um, benefit that we're, that we're trying to catch? Um, are we trying to clean grain to improve, improve, improve the, the words out? Clean the grain to improve the grade or blending the grain. So um, as we said, silos give you flexibility to, to do all of those. Bags, bunkers and sheds. Think of them as a little bit more short term. So 
if you're looking to store for long term or potentially store for long term, um, uh, more potential for trouble there. I also encourage you to, to compare your on-farm storage to bulk handlers or marketing tools. If, if it's purely just um, the seasonal trends in the market, there may actually be other competitive ways to do it than investing in on-farm storage. What I do see is to pay for on-farm storage, most people have to have multiple benefits. Typically you need multiple benefits there to actually um, cover the cost of on-farm storage once you start including um, everything that's involved. Site considerations. So again, plenty ahead for storage. Um, I can't stress enough how important drainage is, um, particularly with the, the larger storage setups. Um, I have seen too many times, unfortunately, people um, want to put storage up at the last minute and they haven't had time to do really good foundations. So they don't want to put um, fill in um, that's not compacted. So they put the slab straight on top of the ground and then they decide Obviously, they need some gravel around that slab, um, and then over the years, the slab ends up being quite low compared to the gravel around it, um, and you end up with drainage issues. So, really encourage you to look ahead at, at where the water is going to flow um, and where the water is going to run to, um, and, and try and plan ahead for drainage. Um, obviously, augers are getting bigger, storage is getting bigger, trucks are getting longer. Um, leave plenty of room for, for expansion. Um, make sure you can you can actually uh, get trucks around the site and, and get August back up. Um, remembering that at harvest time we're probably um, probably in a in a bit of a hurry, um, so the easier we can make that to shift the auger from one silo to the next, um, the, the less likely we are for, for having access. The next one's a tricky one: access to power, but away from power lines. So our aeration uh, cooling, we're drying if we want to go that way. We obviously need some power for that. Uh, so ideally within a, within proximity of power, the main power, and ideally three phase if we're going to, to large flat bottoms, we might need three phase power. Um, or if we're drying, certainly need three phase. Um, but in a spot that you're actually away from the overhead power lines. And the alternative of course is to is to run a generator. And that that price not too bad now. So um, you can compare the price of Trenching power to the site or actually um, running your own, your own generator. And the aeration controllers now will actually be able to start up a generator um, to, to kick in when you, when you want to run the green. The other thing to consider is um, try and keep the storage away from hay sheds um, or trees or, or anywhere that insects can harbour. And typically, insects they, they want two things they want shelter, primarily, um, so they don't like big temperature variations um, or, or weather. And secondly, they want a bit of food. So if you can think of um, things that, that can do those, hay sheds have both. Um, harvest storage, harvest, harvest, grain harvesting equipment have both if they're not cleaned out. Uh, so try and keep away from those places where insects can harbor. Safety considerations. So um, as I said, ideally away from power lines, but if, if it's unavoidable, do what we can to, to try and uh, make those power lines really obvious with some signage and some markers. Um, these little uh, danger signs on the bottom left of your screen um, to warn people when you are fumigating grain in storage. Um, Emerson bunting tape around the bottom of the silo make it really obvious to, to make sure people stay away um, because they're aware that the, the um, silo is under fumigation. There's personal monitors um, you can buy that, that will tell you if, uh, if there's dangerous phosphine readings around, um, whether it be you're actually doing a fumigation or whether it be you're just working near a silo that's under fumigation uh, and potentially something's not as, as planned, this will give you a warning before it, um, phosphine gets to harmful level for you. Just while we're on that, it's good to be aware that um, we can smell phosphine at about two parts per million and it starts doing its damage at about one part per million. So by the time we can smell it, it's uh, it's already doing its damage. Obviously, this uh, safety equipment here, PPE, um, and a harness to, to put to the top of the silo. And again, I, I'd, I'd encourage again. I know it's an extra expense, but ladders on silos really do make life a lot easier for when you do need to get to the top. And I say when because 
because you will. Um, it's a monitoring and for maintenance um, with a storage. It's, it's not a matter of the first plan. I often uh, give these presentations and people say, yes, yeah, Chris, I, I understand all that. We're, we, we can't get the Rolls Royce every time, but we go broke. Um, so I'm going to go for a cheaper model. Just remember that cheaper is not always better. And we're, we're talking, if we're talking permanent on farm storage, we're hoping it's probably going to be there for 30 odd years. So it's pretty hard to trade in if we do get a cheap model and find that it's not, the, not going to suit our needs. It's pretty hard to trade it in like another bit of equipment and replace it with a better one. So I would encourage you to, to, to do your research and really get, um, get the storage that's going to suit you. Here's a resource to help with that, um, the Solo Buyer's Guide, um, which you can find on storedgrain.com.au slash solo buyer's guide. That's actually got a checklist on the back for the things to look for. Um, if, if solos are the, the storage of choice for you, um, that, that's a good resource. We just thought in the last few minutes here, and feel free to type your questions in um, as, as we wrap up here, but I just thought it might be helpful to go through a few um, a few different designs of, of silo layouts uh, and we can comment on the pros and cons of each. This particular one is um, we've got silos all in a line um, and a conveyor system to fill and empty. Um, obviously being in a line we can use the conveyor to fill and empty. Uh, makes blending quite quite easy when we're outloading or inloading. Um, we, we don't have to shift an order every time because we've got that conveyor. So if we're harvesting, uh, say, different different uh, grades of wheat with a different protein wheat coming in, we can segregate them quite well. It's just a matter of shifting shoot, not shifting an order to put each truckload into a different silo. So that's a real benefit of, of this sort of system. Um, the other one I like about this setup is they've left plenty of room right around the site. So if we find we do want to use an auger to either inload or outload, they can access both sides of the silo, so um, really good flexibility there. Maybe the conveyor breaks down or they want to be loading two silos at the same time, they've got good flexibility to be able to do that. The downsides that I can see there, um, those, those conveyors are a bit of a hygiene trap, so um, to be able to clean them out really well, um, you, you, you've got to do a good job there um, to make sure we don't leave insects um, in that uh, conveyor system. The other one, depending on the control system, it's often a two person job to actually outload. Um, you need one person standing at the truck to check when it's full and one person to stand um, at the control lever for the, for the chute to shut off um, that conveyor system. Um, there are systems, of course, that you can do that um, remotely, but um, yeah, that, that could be one. Um, and unless you've got a second auger, you can really only fill or empty one solo uh, at a time with a conveyor system. The other comment I'd make um, on, on looking at, at storage systems with a conveyor is um, just to make sure that adding that conveyor doesn't compromise your ability to seal the silo up to the Australian standard 2628. Particularly on the inlet side of it, how are you actually going to get that um, conveyor inlet out of the road so you can clamp the lid down and seal it if you need to fumigate that silo? Something to be aware of with, uh, with those sort of systems. Here's another one, um, slightly different setup, smaller cone bottom silos, more segregation, um, and they've gone for, for two separate rows, um, which is not a bad idea. It makes good use of the, um, the gravel area between the two rows of silos. Um, and, and again, they've got room, they can actually access these silos from both sides, uh, which I really like for flexibility. Um, it certainly makes good use of this gravel pad between the silos here for most of their work and, and for their shed. Um, something I'd recommend if, if you're looking at this double row system is to have them a bit further apart. 20 metres to me is pretty close together. If you were, say, wanting to fill one silo and empty from another side over here, you probably couldn't do that both at the same time. Um, the other thing I'd like to see uh, is to be able to drive the truck right through. So I think that's a drive through shed, so you can drive a truck right through here. You certainly don't want to be um, backing the truck all the way into the, the back here. So to be able to drive the, 
drive a truck right around the site, that would be a big advantage. Similar idea here, they've got the shed um, on one side, they've got the big gravel pad in front of the shed. That same gravel area is, is used for the, for the silos around the perimeter. Um, so really efficient use of space. Um, if needed, again, they can access silos from both sides if, if they have a need. Um, but yeah, really good sensible layout here. They've got a way bridge, plenty of room for trucks to do, um, do a circuit through the site, not having to back around any more than they need to. Um, the only downside I can see here is that you, you could end up box, being boxed in, um, but I mean that's just a matter of either extending the line out um, to one end or even put a second row uh, in front of or behind those silos. You could do that potentially if you run out of room. One last one here um, the, the circle setup. I'm sure most of you have probably seen these from time to time. Really easy to, um, to fill and empty with. With this auger system, um, quite efficient. I guess one of the big advantages is that when you want to transfer grain, it's really quite easy to transfer from one side to the other. Um, so, quite a clever system. The downsides, of course, if you want to expand, you've got to start another ring um, and, and then, of course, get another auger system. Um, so, that, that's one downside, but um, they're not a bad system. Um, Obviously you can only fill and empty one silo at a time, uh, unless you've got access around the outside and a, a separate auger, you probably could. Um, but yeah, they're, they're a bit of a unique system. Sometimes we see uh, these sort of setups with um, smaller silos, like you can see here, 200 ton and uh, less silos, um, to allow a bit of flexibility. And then uh, they might have a separate line of silos for the bigger flat bottoms. Just to wrap up, uh, in plenty of head for storage, I'd encourage you to do the cost benefit analysis. Um, and again, on storedgrain.com.au, there's a booklet there on the economics um, to, sh to show you how to step through that cost benefit analysis for your farm um, because it is different for everyone. Compare the brands. Um, insist on if you're getting silos, Australian Centre 26 28. Can't stress how important that is. Um, plan out room for expansion in storage. Um, farms are getting bigger, storage systems are getting bigger. Um, I can't see any reason for that to change in the future, so leave yourself plenty of room. Um, and start consolidating foundations. Um, all of these things are, are, are probably going to take a bit of time, not necessarily much money. So if money is tight, these are things that we can do to, to, to work towards storage in the future without having to spend any dollars. Again, match that storage type with the reason for why you're storing grain. Rather than trying to find the cheapest, um, that will in, in turn turn out to be the cheapest because you'll have less value. Um, consider pest prevention. How are we going to stop insects? If we do get them, what are our control options? Um, obviously, as well as managing grain quality through the, through the um, storage period. And remember that permanent on farm storage silos, uh, they're a long-term investment, so it's, it's not wise to cut corners there. Um, it's pretty hard to trade in and, and get another one if we find that we've bought one that doesn't suit our needs. Uh, for those of you who are into QR codes um, or, or the storegrain.com.au uh, website, there's a, a, a really good booklet there on grain storage facilities, which goes through uh, what I've highlighted today, goes through that in, in a lot more detail, has some more examples of different systems there. So I'd encourage you to have a look at that. Um, or, or shoot me an email directly, info at storedgrain.com.au or to contact your nearest grain storage specialist, phone number, which we should all remember, is 1-800-WEEVIL. So that brings us to the end of the, the formal presentation, but I encourage you to put your questions, um, top the questions in there. I can see one come in there, um, which I'll look at just in a minute. Um, and while you're doing that, perhaps, um, Again, just reminded that the next webinar will be on the 13th of August at 10 a.m. Um, and that one we're going to delve a bit deeper into hygiene and structural treatments. Um, so I encourage you to come back for that one. Um, the other thing uh, to expect in your inbox in the next few days, um, we'll shoot in an email with a, a really quick 30 second uh, survey just to, just to get some feedback. would be really appreciative if you could uh, keep an eye out for that. 
Rightio, questions? How much airflow do we need to aerate the dry grain? Thanks for your question. Really good question. So when we talk about aeration, we really need to distinguish between aeration cooling and aeration drying because they are quite different. Aeration cooling, we're talking about two to three, even four litres of air per second per tonne. That's plenty of air for cooling. And, and that's really about pest prevention. We're trying to cool the grain down to a temperature where insects can no longer reproduce. That's the aim with aeration cooling. Of course, the cooler we get the grain, the longer we can also maintain its quality. If we're looking at grain drying, that's a much different, much different system. We're actually trying to carry moisture from the grain right out of the storage. So to do that, we need a much higher airflow rate. So rather than our two to four litres, aeration drying, we're really looking at 15 plus litres of air per second per tonne. So it's not just double, uh, it's not just triple, it's, it's more like five times as much air um, to, to get aeration drying. So quite a different, um, quite a different system. Any other questions uh, from, from you guys? Just while someone might be typing one last one in there, um, again, feel free to use the resources on that storedgrain.com.au website. And, um, or contact your nearest grain storage specialist in the southern region, that will be myself. Uh, that phone number again is 100 Weaving. Um, I'm also happy to come if any of you um, would like a grain storage workshop um, to go through some, some of the things in a bit more detail. Um, happy to come and do a workshop in your, your area. Um, shoot me a, a, an email or give me a call, happy to organise that as well. Right, I've got another question coming here, thank you. Thank you, good question. Will moisture migration be covered in the next webinar? Let me just bring up So the next webinar will be on hygiene and structural treatments. We've got one uh, in September on upgrades to existing storage. In October, we'll be on grain bags and bunkers, more detail. In November, we'll be on grain protectants. In December, we'll be on aeration cooling. So December, I'll go through um, more about aeration cooling. Um, happy to do one uh, on more aeration drying. Um, and as well, it, it, again, if you've got specific questions, happy to take them directly um, to, to, to try and help you out with your needs there. Uh, another one's come in here. Is it an issue if you are in between four and 15 litres per second per ton? I assume that is. Potentially can be, yeah. So when we've got airflow rates between four and 15 litres, we've really got more air than we need for cooling and we've got not enough air for drying successfully. So what can happen is that we start actually start taking a bit of moisture out of the grain at the bottom of the storage and we start moving that moisture up towards the top of the silo but what happens when we don't have enough airflow to push that moisture right at the top of the silo is we get a bit of moisture migration so we get air we get moisture going from the bottom of the stack start moving up out of the, out of the top of the silo but it might only make it halfway or part way up the silo and then it will stall the next thing that will happen generally happen is because we've got high moisture in one particular spot in the silo, um, we get a bit of mould happening, we get a bit of crust happening, and it actually um, it can reduce the capacity of our fan because it actually increases the back pressure on the fan. So great question. Um, aeration between four and 15 litres actually um, can potentially be quite dangerous. So we really want to just decide whether, whether we need cooling down at two to four litres or whether we want to be doing drying for 15 litres plus. That, that in between is quite a, quite a spot we don't want to be. Any other final questions before we finish up? Uh, 
on the stream, that's all. Um, in the interest of time, um, again, thank you very much for your for, uh, for joining in today. Um, appreciate your participation. Um, and yeah, I look forward to seeing you again uh, on the 13th of August to, uh, to have a look at hygiene and structural treatments.